Hey there, my wonderful peeps. How's everyone doing? Hope you're doing wonderful. Hope you're feeling sexy today because in this video, we're going to be talking about sex. The topic that most humans fear or get very uncomfortable talking about, but on Planet Joe, it is the side where the sun shines. For many of you, it might be the dark side, but stay with me and listen because this might be an eye opener for you. Let's talk about sex. Come on. Let's talk about sex, baby. Sex. Mm -hmm. Sex. Sex. Everybody's doing it. Many are not skilled at it. And the saddest part is that most people are not educated about it. Okay, sex education in America and many parts of the world is, in one word, a disgrace. We're going to get into the detailed benefits of sex on the human body and mental health in a few. But before that, I want to ask you. Why is such a beautiful thing that is a part of nature and uh, it's an inseparable part of our being? Uh, why is it so shameful, uh, sinful, private, taboo, or just something that is not to be spoken of? Many sex educators, including me, will tell you that a major factor is religion. Uh, one of the few things that you will find that is common in all religions uh, is sex phobia. I just made that word up. I think. But yeah, sex phobia and misogyny are major um, factors in all religions, I would say. In all religions, sex is a bad thing, right? Sex is sin. Masturbation is bad. Promiscuity and lust are evil forces taking over us, etc., etc. But for now, I'm not going to get into the whole religion is poison debate, not in this video at least, uh, but it is a major factor why most individuals that have issues with sexuality are usually the ones that are either uh, in a religious environment or come out of a religious environment and traumatized from sex phobia. But on the other side of religion, which is science, science and sex educators will tell you the opposite is true about sex. Sex scientists, yes, there is such a thing. Sexologists and sex educators conducted studies around the world and researched why countries have the least, why specific countries have the least harmful sexual effects on its societies, uh, such as STDs, rape, unwanted pregnancies, or any other sexual crimes. The facts and the data uh, they found in countries like, you know, Sweden and Switzerland, overwhelming. When researchers and scientists uh, dove in deeper to find the reasons behind all of that wonderful data, uh, what do you think they discovered? Do you think that they found that those countries uh, suppressed sexuality in society, uh, promoted abstinence, maybe punished and shamed homosexuals, or slut shaming was an everyday thing? Sex is such a big deal that talking about it is extremely uncomfortable. Or showing a woman's breast on national TV is a cause for panic and chaos. Or do you think those countries were crazy enough to educate their citizens or their young citizens on sexuality starting as early as fourth grade? Could any nation in their right mind start talking about sex with their eight-year-olds? Insanity? Goodies. Je vindt iemand aardiger dan gewoon aardig, ja. En wat gebeurt er dan met je als je iemand aardig vindt? Echt een dikke buik, hè, die moeder. Ze ging me vrij. Ja, ze ging me dus vrij, heel goed. Or kids have questions, what, what does my body look like? Why is my body different from my sister or my brother or my friend? Door al met jonge kinderen op een open en ontspannen manier te praten over relaties en seksualiteit, wordt het een heel normaal onderwerp. Don't have sex, because you will get pregnant and die. 
it might sound insanity for many people in many parts of the world, but if we look at the opposite side of the spectrum, where countries and states uh, suppress sexuality, the data is also overwhelming. The countries with the highest rates of violence against women, violence against the LGBTQ community, STDs, unwanted pregnancies, rape, etc., are the religious regions of the world. Uh, and here in the United States, the same shameful data is overwhelmingly high in the conservative religious states. There is no required standard for sex ed in this country. In fact, only 22 states mandate that kids receive it, and only 13 require that the information presented be medically accurate, which is crazy. You, you wouldn't accept a history class not being historically accurate. <laughs> Prince started the American Revolution in 1984, and his purple reign lasts until the present day. Class dismissed. <laughs> we, we essentially have a weird patchwork system that varies wildly, and not just from state to state, but from district to district and even from school to school. In fact, one Ohio newscast tried to find out what kids in their area were learning and hit a brick wall. The state has no, absolutely none, sex ed guidelines, so each school district decides what's best for whatever kid. Many school districts don't want to talk about it at all. You see students polled every school district in four southwest Ohio counties. The majority wouldn't tell us what they teach and when they teach it, even though all of this is supposed to be public information. As a teenager, you're expected to wait until you're married before you become sexually active. Until then, Abstinence is the only option that's acceptable to your family, your school, and your community. Well, hold on. Then why did they even keep the first part about it being a decision at all? They should have just said, no decision is more non-existent than the one you don't get to make about sex. Also, remember, God is watching you masturbate, and the fluids coming out of your genitals are actually his tears. You're making him sad. But, but the very fact Two videos with the same title but very different messages exist shows just how hard it can be to find out what's going on with sex ed where you live. And this is not even accounting for guest speakers that schools can bring in to augment their program. Remember the woman from No Screwing Around? That's Pam Stenzel and her website claims she speaks to half a million young people each year, presumably like this. Here's the line over which you can't step. Absolutely no genital contact of any kind. That's hand to genital, mouth to genital, genital to genital. Oral sex, which is mouth to genital, is sex. And if you have ever stepped over this line, you've risked disease and you need to get tested and don't you dare don't you dare tell anyone you're a virgin! Why... Why are you trying to yell the horniness out of teenagers? Pro programs like hers are so relentlessly anti-sex, you could easily come away thinking the adult world is just an endless barrage of unwanted dicks, which, incidentally, was the original slogan for Tinder. But... But... But the problem is... The problem is, Stenzel is not alone. Shelley Donahue currently speaks at schools around the country. She likes to show the dangers of more than one sexual partner by describing women as a piece of tape and then sticking the tape to the arms of multiple boys until this happens. How many partners do we have before we get married on average in America? Six, yeah. So can you imagine what's going to start to happen to the tape? It's going to lose its bonding power. Her, her point is the tape is used so much it becomes damaged which doesn't even consider the possibility that the tape might be perfectly happy and have had a good time, or that maybe some guys like tape that already knows how to stick when they meet them. <laughs> but, but this idea that sex is something which devalues those who've had it, particularly women, crops up again and again. Non-virgins can be likened to a used toothbrush or a chewed up piece of gum. And then there is this video in which a non-virgin on her wedding night is compared to a dirty shoe. Michelle, what are these? My sneakers. But Michelle, what is this? this? It looks like the entire football team has been in these things. I mean... I, I made them all wear socks. Socks? Michelle, socks don't protect my heart. You can still get foot fungus with socks. I wish I could go back in time and make a commitment to be abstinent until marriage. That 
is heartbreaking. And not just because he's shaming his wife, but because Michelle, socks don't protect my heart, might be the funniest line ever delivered on this show, and we didn't write it. And, and that, that kind of message can be hugely damaging to anyone who hears it, especially survivors of sexual assault, like Elizabeth Smart, who was kidnapped and assaulted at the age of 14. And you may recognise one of the metaphors she remembers one of her teachers using. She said, imagine you're a stick of gum, and when you engage in sex, that's like, that's like getting chewed. And then if you do that lots of times, you're going to become an old piece of gum. And who's going to want you after that? Well, that's terrible, but nobody should ever say that. But for me, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm that chewed up piece of gum. Learning nothing would have been better than learning that. It's not a great reflection on her teacher that kids who were sick that day got a better education than she did. And the sad thing is, sex ed, when done well, can do so much good. But when it's done badly, it can do real harm. There is no way we'd allow any other academic program to consistently fail to prepare students for life after school. And human sexuality, unlike calculus, is something you actually need to know about for the rest of your life. When Pornhub, the biggest porn website in the world, uh, released their data, uh, they do that annually, by the way, uh, it is not surprising to see that those states and countries have the highest rates of pornography consumption and the highest search words such as incest and uh, bestiality. It is shameful that even though there is proof that sex education from an early age only benefits us as adults who are knowledgeable and skilled in sex and relationships, in consent, in homosexuality, in, in BDSM, and teaches us to be safe, responsible, and know the consequences such as pregnancies and STDs. And most importantly, how to respect our fellow humans and accept our differences. With all the facts and the data, conservatives and the religious wholeheartedly fight to keep sex ed out of our schools and uh, and positive sex discussion away from the media and out of our living rooms. Shameful and sad. And it only gets worse uh, when you consider that corporations, advertisers, politicians, and social media networks are also suffering from sex phobia. Uh, this to me and all sex educators and sex activists is personal and it's infuriating. Take YouTube, for example. YouTube will, and often does, uh, demonetize any video which contains any discussion about sex. Uh, sex educators on YouTube don't reap the benefits other YouTube creators do. Now, for me, I'm not worried about that because my channel is new, so I not it's not monetized anyways. I'm not making any money. Um, I don't know if you know, but I need to have at least 4,000 subscribers. Or is it 4,000 hours? Something like that. In order to be able to monetize my videos. But as of now, I've got nothing to lose because uh, my videos are not monetized anyways. So I can say what I want. No, but on a serious note, I mean, there are uh, sex educators that, you know, they're super cautious. They're walking on eggs when they upload a sex education video on YouTube. In most cases, uh, their videos uh, get demonetized. And it's shameful. Sex phobia, again, even though it's a positive sex talk, uh, positive sexual education that even under 18 teenagers can benefit from it, YouTube and probably most people in America freak out from it. They get demonetized, uh, they get kicked out of the platforms sometimes. It's just sad. It's, uh, it's very sad uh, to think that here in America, uh, 2019, sex is still uh, such a taboo. Don't get it. Oh yeah, and, it, and it's not only YouTube. Facebook added to their already strict rules, more strict rules of deleting accounts and posts that even mention sex. Sex phobia! Tumblr uh, made the decision to delete and eliminate all and every adult blog on their platform. And let's not talk about uh, Craigslist and Backpage uh, that were forced to get rid of their adult personals page due to the new awful, terrible oh, FOSTA and SESTA Act. The worst thing ever. I don't know if we should talk about this in this video. 
maybe you know, we'll have a separate video about FOSTA and SESTA. Okay, I'm not going to get started in that. But uh, this, the, the whole FOSTA Act and SESTA is intended to fight sex trafficking, but in reality, it only forced sex workers uh, to go into the shadows and be in much more danger than they were before FOSTA and SESTA. It's just, I don't know, sometimes it seems like we're moving backwards when it comes to uh, sexuality and sex work in America. It's just uh, mind-boggling. But yeah, I think I'm going to do a whole video on SESTA and, and FOSTA that's uh, about sex work. The bottom line is that discussion about sex in our society is suppressed, okay? And the only outcome from that is negative and dangerous. Sex is natural and a part of nature, just like the air we breathe and the food we eat, okay? Can you suppress food? Uh, even if you did, does that mean we'll stop being hungry? Nature is much stronger than beliefs, much stronger than us humans. All the proof for that is right in front of our eyes, etched in history. Kings and world leaders risk their throne, their political career, their marriages for sex. Sex work is the oldest profession in the human race, and it doesn't matter how much we criminalize it or how many um, actually were killed for it, uh, still, natural will push on. Here's another quote from uh, Sex at Dawn by Dr. Christopher Ryan. Though many strive to hide their human libidinousness from themselves and each other, being a force of nature, it breaks through. The absurdity of criminalizing sex work is mind-boggling in biblical proportions, like burning witches at the stake. No government, law enforcement body, or even an army did ever and will ever be able to win nature and eliminate sex work or sex drive in our race. Ever. Guaranteed. The simple physical connection between two consenting adults that is natural, it feels great, healthy, fun, and even empowering is legal, unless it involves a financial transaction. In this talk, I'm going to take you through the four main legal approaches applied to sex work throughout the world and explain why they don't work, why prohibiting the sex industry actually exacerbates every harm that sex workers are vulnerable to. And then I'm going to tell you about what we, as sex workers, actually want. So let's talk about trafficking. Forced labor does occur in many industries, especially those where the workers are migrants or otherwise vulnerable, and this needs to be addressed. But it's best addressed with legislation targeting those specific abuses, not an entire industry. When 23 undocumented Chinese migrants drowned while picking cockles in Morgan Bay in 2004, there were no calls to outlaw the entire seafood industry to save trafficking victims. The solution is clearly to give workers more legal protections, allowing them to resist abuse and report it to the authorities without fear of arrest. The way the term trafficking is thrown around implies that all undocumented migration into prostitution is forced. In fact, many migrants have made a decision out of economic need to place themselves into the hands of people smugglers. Many of them do this with the full knowledge that they'll be selling sex when they reach their destination. And yes, it can often be the case that these people smugglers demand exorbitant fees, coerce migrants into work they don't want to do, and abuse them when they're vulnerable. That's true of prostitution, but it's also true of agricultural work, hospitality work, and domestic work. Ultimately, nobody wants to be forced to do any kind of work, but that's a risk many migrants are willing to take because of what they're leaving behind. If people were allowed to migrate legally, they wouldn't have to place their lives into the hands of people smugglers. The problems arise from the criminalization of migration, just as they do from the criminalization of sex work itself. Right? This is a lesson of history. If you try to prohibit something that people want or need to do, whether that's drinking alcohol or crossing borders or getting an abortion or selling sex, you create more problems than you solve. Prohibition barely makes a difference to the amount of people actually doing those things, but it makes a huge difference as to whether or not they're safe when they do them. Why else might people support prohibition? As a feminist, I know that the sex industry is a site of deeply entrenched social inequality. It's a fact that most buyers of sex are men with money, and most sellers are wi women without. You can agree with all that, I do, and still think prohibition is a terrible policy. In a better, more equal world, maybe there would be far fewer people selling sex to survive. 
but you can't simply legislate a better world into existence. If someone needs to sell sex because they're poor or because they're homeless, or because they're undocumented and they can't find legal work, taking away that option doesn't make them any less poor or house them or change their immigration status. People worry that selling sex is degrading. Ask yourself, is it more degrading than going hungry or seeing your children go hungry? There's no call to ban rich people from hiring nannies or getting manicures, even though most of the people doing that labor are poor migrant women. It's the fact of poor migrant women selling sex specifically that has some feminists uncomfortable. And I can understand why the sex industry provokes strong feelings. People have all kinds of complicated feelings when it comes to sex. But we can't make policy on the basis of mere feelings, especially not over the heads of the people actually affected by those policies. If we get fixated on the abolition of sex work, we end up worrying more about a particular manifestation of gender inequality rather than about the underlying causes. People get really hung up on the question, or would you want your daughter doing it? That's the wrong question. Instead, imagine she is doing it. How safe is she at work tonight? Why isn't she safer? So, we've looked at full criminalization, but we need more allies. If you care about gender equality, or poverty, or migration, or public health, then sex worker rights matter to you. Make space for us in your movements. That means not only listening to sex workers when we speak, but amplifying our voices. Resist those who silence us, those who say that a prostitute is either too victimized, too damaged to know what's best for herself, or else too privileged and too removed from real hardship, not representative of the millions of voiceless victims. This distinction between victim and empowered is imaginary. It exists purely to discredit sex workers and make it easy to ignore us. No doubt many of you work for a living. Well, sex work is work too. Just like you, some of us like our jobs, some of us hate them. Ultimately, most of us have mixed feelings. But how we feel about our work isn't the point. And how others feel about our work certainly isn't. What's important is that we have the right to work safely and on our own terms. Sex workers are real people. We've had complicated experiences and complicated responses to those experiences. But our demands are not complicated. You can ask expensive escorts in New York City, brothel workers in Cambodia, street workers in South Africa, and every girl on the roster at my old job in Soho, and they will all tell you the same thing. You can speak to millions of sex workers and countless sex worker-led organizations. We want full decriminalization and labor rights as workers. I'm just one sex worker on the stage today, but I'm bringing a message from all over the world. Thank you. And what is even more mind-boggling is the fact, it is a fact by the way, that criminalizing sex work only creates the negatives that exist in sex work, such as human trafficking, pimps, violence against women, and even health issues. Why did I say it is a fact with confidence? It's easy. Just take a look at places where sex work is legal. Let's look at the Netherlands and Australia, for example. Sexual crimes and violence against women are significantly lower than before it was legal in those countries. Sex workers are regularly tested for STDs and regulated by their government. They even get health benefits. Unlike in countries where it's illegal, where thousands of women, men and transgender individuals as well, of course, are not thrown to the sidelines of society and forced to hide in the shadows, risking their lives or risking going to jail. Uh, most of them won't report violence against them because of everything I just mentioned, because it's illegal, which is a field day for violent abusers. This is a scientific matter. It's not an emotional or a political matter. Prostitution is not a significant vector in the spread of STDs or HIV. The former Surgeon General Jocelyn Elders, Surgeon General of the United States, has come out for decriminalizing prostitution, and her concern is health, because if you decriminalize prostitution, it will help restrain HIV. When we are debating violence, we need to make sure what we are talking about. And if we are talking about women who are suffering actual physical violence, 
then the response is we need to protect them and not criminalize them. There is a deliberate attempt to conflate prostitution and trafficking. It used to be, uh, you know, generation, a couple generations ago, all about, uh, you know, people who do this are, are immoral. They started finding people actually, you know, have a lot of sympathy with sex workers. And so now the new thing is that, that we're being exploited. Although people like me are basically invisible in this narrative. Right now the state arrests people that they think are victims of human trafficking under the prostitution law. So, so essentially in our state we have trafficked victims arrested. Money is involved in, in most of these rights that we cherish and value. So to say that suddenly sex isn't protected anymore as a right just because there's money involved is really flying in the face of, uh, of all our other rights. When we talk about commodification, you know, we're signaling that we don't approve of what's going on. We're not signaling why we don't approve. We're not giving reasons for disapproving of prostitution. We're just signaling that we have a very, very deep emotional opposition to it. I think the judicial system is where we're going to find our relief, and I really think that the American public is ready. They're ready to throw off all of these draconian laws and move forward as a society. Hey everyone, today I want to talk to you about the argument for decriminalizing all sex work, and that includes prostitution. To start with, let's go over the state of laws concerning sex work right now. In many parts of the world, including the US, prostitution is illegal. People can be arrested and jailed or fined if they're caught. In other parts of the world, prostitution is legal but heavily regulated. In others, selling sex is legal but buying sex is illegal. This is usually called the Nordic model. And then, in very few places in the world, including New Zealand, sex work is simply decriminalized. Criminalized. In this video, I want to make the argument that New Zealand's approach to sex work, complete decriminalization, is the correct path to follow. Other current sex work models are extremely harmful to sex workers and force their profession underground, which makes them vulnerable to all kinds of abuse. Because when you make prostitution completely illegal, you don't get rid of sex work, you just drive it into the shadows. It's like how the prohibition of alcohol in the US in the 1920s didn't work because people just went around the law, and it actually resulted in a lot more criminal activity around alcohol. The the prohibition of sex work is similar in that people will continue to have access to sex work, but in this case it puts sex workers' lives in danger. When sex workers' profession isn't legal, they have no way of protecting themselves from their employers or clients. If their boss doesn't pay them or harasses them or anything like that, they have no method of recourse because they work outside the law. If a client sexually assaults or abuses them, they can't go to the police about it. If they're accidentally injured on a job, their client can't call an ambulance. There are so many aspects to sex work that would be a million times safer if people could just do their work without fear of being arrested for it. For example, in New Zealand, where sex work has been decriminalized, a sex worker in 2014 was able to sue her employer for sexual harassment and won. That could never happen in the US or any other country where prostitution is illegal. Now, one kind of backlash that I've heard a few times is that people often think that sex work is inherently coercive and therefore no sex workers are working of their own accord. The argument I often hear is that allegedly people only turn to sex work as a last resort and therefore they're only doing it so that they can put a roof over their head and food on the table. But like, the thing is, that's what all jobs are. People work all kinds of shitty, stressful jobs that they wouldn't otherwise want to do just to survive. That's the nature of capitalism. It sucks, but in our current system, we all have to work to survive. Consensual sex work is no more coercive than any other job. And in fact, plenty of sex workers really like their job. I think it robs sex workers of their agency to claim that you know what they want or don't want better than they do. Sex workers don't sell their bodies any more than a coal miner sells their body. They both still have their bodies at the end of the day. What they're selling is labor. Whether that labor is hammering away in a coal mine or having sex, it's just labor. The only reason you would view sex work as lesser than other professions would be if you view sex as something that is dirty and makes people lesser than. But that's a weirdly conservative Puritan view of sex that I thought many of us had gotten past by now. Sex is just sex, and any moral judgment you're attaching onto that is your own. People aren't worse just for engaging in sex in a way that you personally wouldn't. 
different. Everyone is different and is comfortable with different things. That being said, there are people who are coerced into sex trafficking and are forced to be there. That is very, very different from sex work. Trafficking is a whole different thing and proponents of legalizing sex work are still very anti-sex trafficking. Nobody wants to decriminalize sex trafficking. But decriminalizing sex work could empower sex workers to feel more comfortable speaking up about people they think are being trafficked. So in that way, decriminalizing sex work would not only help sex workers, but it could also help trafficking victims. We all want to see an end to sex trafficking because it is horrific. But current anti-sex work laws are not protecting trafficking victims, they're just hurting sex workers. The other models for addressing sex work tend to fail in certain areas as well. In places where sex work is legalized and regulated, those regulations are often so stringent and nonsensical that they drive people into the shadows anyway, which defeats the whole purpose. That's why many sex workers advocate solely for decriminalization and not legalization. Decriminalization simply means that prostitution would not be a crime. Legalization means bringing in a whole framework of regulation that would continue to exclude many sex workers. And then there are places where buying sex is illegal but selling sex is not, also known as the Nordic model. This is often lauded as a more progressive approach to prostitution, but in practice it still ends up harming sex workers. They're forced to work once again in the shadows because their clients are afraid of the law. At its core, the Nordic model fails because it still assumes that sex work is an inherently negative thing. Why should paying to have sex with a sex worker be illegal? Once again, it's a value judgment being imposed on people. People should have the right to engage in sex work as they see fit. You shouldn't impose your morals on other people if they're not harming anyone. Sex work does no harm to people, so the only reason to criminalize any part of it would be to police people's morality based on some old conservative view of sex. The truly progressive view should be decriminalizing sex work completely. And I'm only making this argument because I've seen so many sex workers speaking up about it. Sex workers themselves have been arguing for decriminalization for decades. I'll put some links in the description so you can go read the perspectives of some sex workers because I think they're the most important voice to be listening to in regards to sex work laws. But also it's worth noting that Amnesty International, a major human rights organization, fully supports the decriminalization of sex work. They spent a lot of time interviewing sex workers and understanding the situation, and the conclusion they came to was that decriminalizing all sex work is the best path forward in terms of human rights. Also in support of decriminalizing sex work is all of these groups, ranging from the World Health Organization to Anti-Slavery International. Decriminalizing sex work is not a fringe idea. It's been tested in New Zealand as well as in Australia's state of New South Wales, and it has been highly effective. The vast majority of sex workers and many large human rights organizations all support the decriminalization of sex work. This is an achievable goal that we should all get behind. We can and should push to decriminalize all sex work in the U.S. and other parts of the world. Anyways, that's all I had for you today. Remember to check out some of the links in the description for further reading, and I highly suggest listening to sex workers themselves about all of this. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. In societies where sex work is legal and accepted, men and women are calmer with the option to get their sexual fantasies and, and their natural sexual appetite satisfied. Uh, the benefits uh, the disabled or the ones who are incapable of having a relationship, like our fellow humans with mental health issues, are tremendous. And many sex workers, where it's legal, love their occupation. Many expand their skills and even get certified in sexual expertise, such as uh, Tantra or sex coaching or uh, erotic massage and counseling for couples, to name a few. They actually contribute to their community. Here's another great quote from Sex at Dawn. Why is the conventional marriage so much damn work? How has the incessant grinding campaign of socio-scientific insistence upon the naturalness of sexual monogamy combined with a couple thousand years of fire and brimstone failed to rid even the priests, preachers, politicians, and professors of their prohibited desires? To see ourselves as we are, we must begin by acknowledging that of all Earth's creatures, none is as urgently, creatively, and constantly sexual as Homo sapiens. Guess who can give you a more healthy and accurate sex advice? Your local religious leader, who in their ethos sex is a sin, or from a person who had sex with, I don't know, over 200 people. Being good at sex is a skill to be learned and from experimenting with a wide variety of people. And believe me, pleasuring the female body is a complex skill to be learned. <laughs> but the gratification is splendid.
Okay, I'm a sex coach, soon to be certified, and I can easily spend an hour just by telling you the years and hours I've spent and invested in sex education and sexual experience. Uh, it can never be taught if that crucial to life subject is silenced and suppressed. I can't say this enough, but sex education, uh, the right sex education, which is not confined to any negative connotation, uh, guilt or shame, where it is to be celebrated as a beautiful and natural thing, is only beneficial to us in every way. And I mean in every way. Some of you might not know this, but to be active sexually without shame makes us better in our careers in our relationships uh, to other human beings, including our children, family, and friends, and even strangers. When our sexual energy is not suppressed, that energy is the most powerful energy in the human body. Plus the wonderful physical and mental health benefits of sex, such as boosting self-esteem, reduced stress and anxiety, and increased happiness. Uh, studies prove that sexual activity correlates with increased satisfaction with your mental health, increased levels of trust, intimacy, and love in your relationships with anyone. Check out this quote from Psychology Today. There's an old saying, sex is like food. It's only a big deal when you're not getting enough of it. There's some truth to the adage. When it comes to sex, it's not really a matter of the more the better, at least after a certain point, but that there are downsides to a complete fast. Lack of sex can lead to feelings of angst, self-doubt, and inadequacy, and there is strong evidence that feelings of self-worth and identity are strongly associated with sex. Sex strengthens your immune system, lowers blood pressure, burns calories, increasing heart health, strengthening muscles, reducing your risk of heart disease, stroke, and hypertension. Studies have shown that being active sexually lengthens your lifespan, improves your ability to perceive, identify, and express emotions, lessens the use of your immature psychological defense mechanism or the mental processes to reduce distress from emotional conflict, increasing libido. Sex even makes you smarter. Here's another quote from an article on Psychology Today. Sex changes your brain chemistry in a variety of ways, and one of them is increasing your brain power. There is evidence that sex actually increases your cognitive capacity. A study published in the Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin found that even just thinking about a sexual encounter that you have had can enhance analytic skills. Another study on rats indicates that sexually active rodents had more neurons in their hippocampus, the brain region responsible for the storage of memories, than virgin rats. And the rats lost improvements in brain power after sexual activity stopped. Research on the female orgasm, and this is on human females, using fMRI technology has indicated that sexual climax activates as many as 30 areas of the brain. Blood flows in, carrying a surge of nutrients and oxygen to the brain cells. By contrast, popular brain stimulation activities such as Sudoku, crosswords, and uh, memory games each engage only a handful at best. Sex is life, my peeps. I can go on for hours on the benefits of sex, and it goes without saying that the opposite side of the spectrum is true too. Um, if you don't have sex, your body reacts to that as well. Can you guess the things that happen to your body when you don't have sex? Uh, you'll feel more stressed. As I mentioned before, sex is a stress inhibitor, so without it, it will be harder to deal with your normal stress levels. You might even get sick more often. In numerous studies, participants who reported having sex regularly were found to have higher levels of an important immunoglobulin that is known to increase resistance to illness. Your libido will drop, arousal might get harder, and you'll be more forgetful. Scientists say that increased sexual activity can even reverse the effects of aging and stress on the brain. I can go on and on for hours, but uh, I'll just put some links for you down below uh, if you want to read about all these uh, studies and watch the videos of the resources that I mentioned. So all the links down below, click on them, study it, dig deeper, research it for yourself. Okay, monogamy. Let's talk about monogamy. 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 Mo no no nagami. I bet you think that monogamy is natural. Most people do. Here's another quote from Sex at Dawn. 
Monogamy is not found in any social group living primate except if the standard narrative is to be believed, us. Let's hear Dr. Christopher Ryan talking about monogamy. That human sexuality has essentially evolved until agriculture as a way of establishing and maintaining the complex, flexible social systems, networks that our ancestors were very good at. And that's why our species has survived so well. Um, now this makes some people uncomfortable, and so I always need to take a moment in these talks to say, listen, I'm saying our ancestors were promiscuous, but I'm not saying they were having sex with strangers. There were no strangers. Right? A hunter-gatherer band, there are no strangers. You've known these people your entire life. So I'm saying, yes, there were overlapping sexual relationships, that our ancestors probably had several different sexual relationships going on at any given moment in their adult lives. But I'm not saying they were having sex with strangers. I'm not saying that they didn't love the people they were having sex with. And I'm not saying there was no pair bonding going on. I'm just saying it wasn't sexually exclusive. And those of us who have chosen to be monogamous, my parents, for example, uh, have been married for 52 years monogamously. And if it wasn't monogamously, mom and dad, I don't want to hear about it. Uh, I'm not criticizing this, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. What I'm saying is that to argue that our ancestors were sexual omnivores is no more a criticism of monogamy than to argue that our ancestors were dietary omnivores is a criticism of vegetarianism. You can choose to be a vegetarian, but don't think that just because you've made that decision, bacon suddenly stops smelling good. Okay? So this is my point. <laughs> that one took a minute to sink in, huh? Uh, <laughs> and humans are among the only species on the planet where the female is available for sex throughout the menstrual cycle. Whether she's menstruating, whether she's postmenopausal, whether she's already pregnant, this is vanishingly rare uh, among mammals. So it's a very interesting aspect of human sexuality. Now this, this evidence goes way beyond anatomy. It goes into anthropology as well. Historical records are full of accounts of people around the world who have sexual practices that should be impossible given what we uh, have assumed about human sexual evolution. These women are the most swell from southwestern China. In their society, everyone, men and women, are completely sexually autonomous. There's no shame associated with sexual behavior. Women have have hundreds of partners, doesn't matter, nobody cares, nobody gossips, it's not an issue. When the woman becomes pregnant, the child is cared for by her, her sisters, and her brothers. The biological father is a non-issue. On the other side of the planet, in the Amazon, we've got many tribes with, which practice what anthropologists call partable paternity. These people actually believe and they have no contact among them, no common language or anything, so it's not an idea that's spread, it's an idea that's arisen around the world. They believe that a fetus is literally made of accumulated semen. So a woman who wants to have a child who's smart and funny and strong, makes sure she has lots of sex with the smart guy, the funny guy, and the strong guy to get the essence of each of these men into the baby. And then when the child is born, she, the, these different men will come forward and acknowledge their paternity of the child. So paternity is actually sort of a team endeavor in this society, right? So there are all sorts of examples like this that we go through in the book. Now why does this matter? Edward Wilson says we need to understand that human sexuality is first a bonding device and only secondarily procreation. I think that's true. This matters because our evolved sexuality is in direct conflict with many aspects of the modern world. The contradictions between what we're told we should feel and what we actually do feel generates a huge amount of unnecessary suffering. My hope is that a more accurate, updated understanding of human sexuality will lead us to have greater tolerance for ourselves, for each other, greater respect for unconventional relationship configurations like same-sex marriage or polyamorous unions, and that will finally put to rest the idea that men have some innate instinctive right to monitor and control women's sexual behavior. Thank you. And we'll see that it's not only gay people that have to come out of the closet. We all have closets we have to come out of. 
right? And when we do come out of those closets, we'll recognize that our fight is not with each other. Our fight is with an outdated Victorian sense of human sexuality that conflates desire with property rights, generates shame and confusion in place of understanding and empathy. It's time we move beyond Mars and Venus because the truth is that men are from Africa and women are from Africa. Thank you. It's all we know since we invented agriculture. When we look back in history, thousands of years back, there was no such thing as monogamy. Human tribes shared the duties of raising their young. It was the responsibility of everyone in the tribe. Sex was a pleasurable act that everyone shared with each other. Here's a quote from Paul Edward Thero, an American travel writer. Sex was an expression of friendship. In Africa, it was like holding hands. It was friendly and fun. There was no coercion it was offered willingly. Tribes were dependent on their tribe as a whole. Tribes that did not care for each other did not survive. At the birth of agriculture, tribes broke into individuals, where each person can grow their own vegetables and another person can grow fruit, for example. Uh, that's the point in time where individual ownership started its evolution. The man who owned the potato farm wanted only his children to inherit what he worked for so hard. And the only way to make sure it is his children, it was to be with one woman and to make her his property as well. If she had sex with others, the farmer could not be sure the born children are his. And that's also the time in history where ownership of the woman meant to control her activities and uh, react in violence when she laid with another. Fast forward a few hundred years, uh, the ownership of women became a legal ritual where the woman belongs to the man legally on paper. Uh, and she will also have to give up her family name since she is the property of the man who will provide for her so she can give birth to his heirs. That's also when inequality for the female sapiens began. Uh, the only access to food and shelter women had was through a man. Again, here's Dr. Christopher Ryan, the author of Sex at Dawn, who can explain it better than I can. So things started to change when agriculture came about. Right. And, and all of a sudden, there's this imbalance of power, and the, the notion of monogamy really starts to take hold. Right. Yeah. The, the notion of monogamy is really a subset of the notion of property. And the notion of property wasn't active uh, until the advent of agriculture. I, I hear it, and it makes sense. But I don't want to believe it. Why? Because I'm so conditioned by society right. to to believe in monogamy. I'm in a relationship that I want to be monogamous, but at the same time, I understand the biological urges to not be monogamous. I believe that you can fight back against your social conditioning and train yourself to accept what the evidence proves. And if the evidence proves that we are not biologically driven to be monogamous, then I can somehow convince myself that it's okay to be in a relationship that's not monogamous. But then I think about my boyfriend and I think about what I would do to him if he wasn't monogamous <laughs> and the, the feelings that I would have. And I, it's just incredible to me that, you know, there are lots of people out there who are able to have these open relationships, who are able to accept yeah. what the reality is and it's because they have not only learned but they truly believe in the difference between monogamy not monogamy intimacy true intimacy and sex those are two completely different things so for someone who wants to not only buy into this but also live this type of lifestyle is there a way that you can undo the social conditioning or is it just too deep in us that there's no hope I think it's a mistake to read a book like ours and say Oh, I see. Our species evolved to be like this, so therefore I should be like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's every bit as much a mistake as people who say, you know, everyone has to be monogamous because that's what God said. Mm -hmm. every, there's wide variation in our species on anything. Mm -hmm. Some people aren't sexual at all. Some people want to have sex every hour, uh, you know, or they go crazy. There, you know, I could argue that our species is highly sexual. That doesn't mean that everybody is highly sexual. Some people just aren't. So I think that it's very important to respect who you are. Mm -hmm. And if who you are is, I can't uh, take a relationship seriously if I don't know certain things, then be true to that. that that's completely cool. And, and 
that's who you have evolved to be. Right. You know? I mean, that's a, that's a really important caveat to take into consideration. But I do think that your book is important in helping people understand the difference between sex and uh, true intimacy. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think the line we use in the book is that um, love and sex are like red wine and blue cheese. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're two very different things. They go together very nicely, yes. uh, if you happen to like blue cheese or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever kind of cheese. But, um, but it's a mistake to think they're, they're one thing, um, because then you run into all sorts of problems. Then, you know, you, you notice your boyfriend checking someone out, and you know he's sexually attracted to her, mm -hmm. and so then you feel insulted because you think that's a statement about your love. It's a reflection love. of you. Right. right. And your relationship with him, whereas in fact it has nothing to do with you, right? Mm -hmm. Him looking at her with a feeling of desire is no different than looking at a sunset or a rainbow or some other thing that's beautiful and pleasing, you know, to his eyes. And so I think it's a great tragedy when couples paint themselves into these corners where they feel threatened by something that is unavoidable, which right. is that you both will be attracted to other people. And that's natural. That's completely natural, unavoidable, and it's a source of pleasure and beauty. Right. Why piss on that? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I remember having a conversation with you previously, and you told me about how your wife will point out attractive women. And then be like, oh, afraid, you guys like, both. I, she doesn't want me to miss it. Like, hey, right. don't, don't miss her, you know. She'll, like, squeeze my hand or something, like, check her out. Yeah, she's That's amazing. Like, <laughs> but, uh, I mean. Yeah, yeah, I'm all about that, too. I totally do that. <laughs> Why not? See, no, because no, absolutely. then you're sharing it. You're sharing you're it. You're not and in opposition. That's exactly right. I think the sharing it uh, component is so important because then it's, it's no longer something that's, you know, covered in deception and lies, right. and it's something that you're enjoying together as a couple, which is right. a completely different story. I think that a lot of the fear comes from losing that person, right? So, right. so if this person that I'm with, that I love, that I, I'm intimate with, admires the beauty of someone else, well, I run up. I run into the issue of possibly losing that person. Right. But let's think that through a little mm -hmm. bit, right? First of all, any relationship can be lost at any time, right? So the idea that somehow you're uh, lessening the chances might be, or eliminating the chances, is completely makes no sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I think that what often happens is that by forcing our partner to accept a lie, mm -hmm. which is that you're not attracted to anyone else, <laughs> and I'm not attracted to anyone else and never will be, then you're basing your relationship on something that you both know is false. And so then your partner's in a position of saying, eventually coming to a point saying, well, so I need to keep living her lie or his lie. And I just don't, I can't live that lie. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, it's like uh, one of you is bisexual and the other says, but you can never look at a, another man. Well, if I'm bisexual. Leave me alone, you know? Right. So I think w a lot of couples, out of fear of losing or fear of losing the relationship, they end up structuring the relationship in a way that's self-destructive, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I know people, for example, uh, friends of mine have an open marriage, and I was talking with uh, the man about this, and I said, what do you say about, you know, people think it's, it's risky, and he's like, Dude, I would never leave this woman. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Why would I leave her? Like, I, I have a girlfriend, and my wife is really nice to her, and sometimes we have three ways, mm -hmm. and I'm going to leave this woman? Hell no. Does it go both ways, though? Does, does yeah. she get to fool around as well? Does she have a boyfriend? Yeah. Amazing. That's an amazing setup. They're very fluid, and the ones that are successful are the ones where the people love each other so much that... They're both constantly um, checking in and making sure the other person's all right. Mm -hmm. It's not about causing pain to the person that you love at all. It's about what it's about is trying to have the person you love have the most pleasurable, wonderful, rich existence they can possibly have. That's amazing. And, yeah. you know, we have to admit we can't be everything mm -hmm. to someone. Yeah. You know, this is one of the... I think important things about um, new relationship paradigms like polyamory 
is that these things get discussed and studied and, and um, there become, there's a language for it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in polyamory, what you're talking about is NRE, New Relationship Energy. Yeah, right? and I love that shit. Right. I'm addicted Everybody to it. Everybody loves yeah. that shit, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. that's the magic. That's yeah. the, you know, this person thinks I'm incredible and yeah. I can't wait to be with her and you can't think it. That's uh, not love, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's NRE. That's New Relationship Energy. And so in these polyamory communities, that's understood like, oh, that's, that's going to last a couple of months, mm -hmm. you know, and then you'll arrive at reality and then we'll see. And when you understand that that's just what that is, then you don't leave your husband for it. You know, you don't leave your wife. And if there's a space in your life to enjoy that while it lasts and not have that be threatening to something that's sacred and profound in your life then it's not as much of a threat. So I see that's where I get back to what I was saying earlier, like this idea like, oh, I might lose this relationship if I let my partner think or do anything or whatever, is actually the opposite of the case right. often. Right. You know, the, you know, I always I feel like, uh, you know, if I were in a cage, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, that was comfortable and nice and wonderful and the door was always open, I wouldn't really be thinking about leaving yeah i mean i i definitely know that the more possessive you are the more likely you are to push someone away well because that possession is an expression of insecurity right and that insecurity manifests in so many different ways uh in my from my perspective none of which are attractive mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. um because uh you know we're all insecure but but my my feeling and my wife shares this feeling is you know maturity is working away from those things not mm -hmm. denying them but working through them and getting to a point where you're not uh, so vulnerable and feeling insecure all the time yeah. and then you get old and die and it never matters it doesn't matter anyway it matters. Yeah. honestly superficial issue I, I, I love it i love that you gave that great explanation chris ryan you uh -huh. guys should check out his work read his book i guarantee you you will not regret it it was awesome and you've been on the show so many times before and i appreciate you coming back to talk to me about it Anytime with you, Anna. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed the interview, and we'll see you next time on TYT Interviews. Yep. Dr. Ryan is a smart man. And Anna from the Young Turks, uh, she's super cute in that uh, interview. Okay, let's continue. To this day, women happily give up their family name when getting married. Uh, they transfer ownership to the man, and it's totally acceptable because that's what our culture has known for thousands of years. Now, these are facts from our uh, Homo sapien history. Whether you're not comfortable hearing it or if you feel that it all makes total sense, um, that is the truth. I'm not saying that not monogamy is for everyone, uh, but if you're like me where it's an early age, even though I didn't understand why I think differently, uh, I was fascinated with women before even puberty uh, and I wanted to be with all the women in the world. <laughs> uh, but little did I know that I was true to my homo sapiens uh, genes and DNA that nature was shaping my humanness. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have had hippie parents who never suppressed my thoughts or beliefs. Um, as long as I didn't hurt myself or others, everything was acceptable. That being said, uh, I'm not trying to tell you what to think or what is right or wrong for you. Uh, only you know that. Um, but I'm talking to the ones who feel that monogamy is not right for them. Uh, to the ones who, like me, their libido is through the roof <laughs> and want to explore and experiment with their sexuality and not with the same person. If that's you, I'm here to encourage you to follow those strong feelings uh, and not feel bad about it or ashamed about it. Uh, own it, embrace it, learn it and enjoy it. <laughs> Also, and this is very important for me to say, um, I'm not here to shame or talk down upon the ones who feel that monogamy is the only way for them. Um, it works for them and they don't see themselves in any other relationship than a monogamous one. Um, that's wonderful. You know, we're all different and there's no one way that works for everyone in any field, not just sexuality or relationships. But to me personally, monogamy doesn't work. Um, and yes, I have been in monogamous relationships before, but the non-monogamous relationships I've had, uh, to me, felt more aligned with nature 
where there is no sexual exclusivity, uh, where no one person can be everything to another person, uh, where honesty and trust is so valuable that nothing can break that special bond with that person, uh, even having sex with others or loving others. Okay, one more quote from Dr. Ryan. Firstborn children often feel jealous when a younger sibling is born. Wise parents make a special point of reassuring the child that she'll always be special, that the baby doesn't represent any kind of threat to her status, and that there's plenty of love for everyone. Why is it so easy to believe that a mother's love isn't a zero-sum proposition, but that a sexual love is a finite resource? It's so true and makes so much sense. Where you love and respect each other with the added value of total freedom to explore the world outside of the relationship cage, if you will. Uh, it just feels so natural, like a flowing river into an ocean of endless possibilities, emotions, experiences, uh, life. In my world on Planet Joe, uh, what you might call a one night stand, I call a wonderful short love story where two humans connect and bond sexually and physically for the pleasure of mutual satisfaction and well-being. Remember, sex is healthy. Or what you might call friends with benefits, I call a wonderful relationship without the sexual tension. Here's a quote from one of my favorite books of all time, The Ethical Slut. Sex is for pleasure, a complete and worthwhile goal in and of itself. People have sex because it feels very good, and then they feel good about themselves. A sexual relationship may last for an hour or two. It's still a relationship. Participants have related to one another as sex partners, companions, lovers, for the duration of their interaction. A friendship that simply includes all the healthy benefits of sexuality, touch, hugging, cuddling. Uh, and for those of you who believe in monogamy and are waiting to meet that special someone, until then, have sex with a friend. <laughs> because many times it can take a long time until you meet that special someone. So why starve your body from sex until that happens? Just like if I like steaks uh, and I can't have steaks, I'm going to starve myself until I can. Mm, doesn't make sense. So yeah, do it. Have fun. Just do it. Have fun. You live once. Okay, and to wrap it up, uh, last topic we're going to talk about in this video is pornography. Is pornography bad for society? Is there such a thing as porn addiction? The answer to both of these questions is unequivalently no. Pornography, like any other form of entertainment, is, well, entertainment. Can you be addicted to movies, plays, TV, music? Well, the simple answer is that we can be addicted to anything. Social media and cell phones, anyone? <laughs> uh, science studies have shown us that the individuals who are, quote, addicted to porn, unquote, are individuals who are susceptible to addiction, which means if porn was eliminated from the world, uh, those individuals would have been addicted to something else. The addiction is not the source, but the person. Now, I'm not in any way, shape or form saying that our fellow humans who are prone to addictions are bad people or that we're better than them. Uh, it is a whole different subject, addiction, um, which I won't get into in this video, but I must emphasize that I have much respect and empathy for those with addiction personalities. I can also tell you that there have been studies on pornography consumption, on its negative effects on the human brain, which is none. And contrary from what you hear from anti-porn organizations and sources, there is no evidence whatsoever that porn can cause an addiction. None. Here's a short clip from Holly Randall, which I love to death, uh, from her uh, podcast. Uh, let's hear it from the professional. Sexuality is one of the strongest drives behind all human behavior. It's, I mean, it's been instilled in us because it's, it's right. what we need in order to procreate and to continue to exist on this planet. And so when you tell people that they can never have sex, they can never have that intimate bond with another human mm -hmm. being, I just find that it always works itself out in some other sick and perverted ways. And, you know, that's not just the priests in the Catholic Church. I think you can apply that to, you know, anybody who's been sexually repressed. You see that everywhere in, you know, countries where there's high levels of sexual repression. You have higher levels of violence mm -hmm. against women, 
sex crimes, and, and you talk about that in your book. And so, um, I mean, to me, it seems incredibly obvious, but I know that that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. So yeah. what do you think, I have a question, though, what do you think about, what about people, so you don't believe in sex addiction, or you don't believe in porn addiction, what about people who say that they compulsively cannot stop watching porn and that it interferes with their lifestyle and it interferes with their work and that it's something they spend all their time on the internet. What do you think mm -hmm. that, that that is? Significant research around these issues identifies that as many as 90% of these folks struggling with sex or porn addiction um, have another mental health issue. Mm -hmm. Typically depression or anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, sometimes autism, and um, this repetitive kind of obsessive, we'll call it compulsive behavior, um, is a symptom of something else. Now, one of the things that, you know, that it is men who are getting diagnosed with this. Women who get diagnosed as, as sex addicts or love addicts is typically all about slut shaming. So we have all of these men who, you know, don't know how to manage negative emotions, depression, sadness, anger, um, anxiety, worry. And, and, Masturbation and watching porn is a really effective way to change the way your brain is working at the moment mm -hmm. and turn on some of those sexual kind of components of your brain that make you not worry. When we are turned on, it's hard to worry about stuff. And so that feels really good for somebody who is feeling depressed or feeling sad and really worrying a lot. It, it's, it's escape. Porn is escape too. The problem is that we have grossly neglected adolescents and children in our society, and we have generations now of kids um, who were taught nothing about sex because abstinence-only kind of education, and now they're learning about sex from porn, and then everybody's all upset. Well, they're learning bad lessons. Well, whose fucking fault is that? <laughs> that is so true. I mean, the lack of sexual education here in the States is absolutely incredible. It's it's appalling, and in you know in the Netherlands where they um, start with developmentally appropriate sex education as early as six and seven, um, with you know letting kids see what genitalia and naked bodies look like mm -hmm. at those early ages, lower rates of sexual violence, lower rates of teen pregnancy, um, much greater levels of healthy kind of self-directed sexuality, mm -hmm. um, because they're removing the shame. Right. I, one of the lucky things I get to do is travel and do trainings for mental health therapists. Mm -hmm. One of the things that a lot of people don't know is that most therapists, roughly around 85 to 90 percent of mental health therapists in the country, have no training in sexuality. None whatsoever. Even though, you know, sexuality issues have something to do with people's lives, relationships, depression, satisfaction. You know, the more sex someone has, the greater levels of life satisfaction they report. Right. But we're not teaching therapists to talk about sex. And so what happens is that any, uh, you know, if you are interested in a kind of sex or have more sex than your therapist, they diagnose you as a sex addict or a nymphomaniac or whatever. Um, and so, you know, my job now is training therapists on how to, how to deal with modern sexuality because society is really changing and we're becoming more open talking about sexuality issues that we've never talked about before. Um, those are walking in the door for therapists and they're really kind of struggling. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for coming on. This has been really, really interesting. Um, I want to make sure that everybody knows that they should get his books, um, Insatiable Wives, Ethical Porn for Dicks, and what was the third one? The Myth of Sex Addiction. The Myth of Sex Addiction. And uh, what's your website and social media handles they can find you on? Yeah, you know, um, at Twitter, um, uh, Twitter at Dr. David Lay, last name is L-E-Y, is the best way to find me. You know, I'm kind of lazy. I don't really have a website. You can find me on Psychology Today. I write a lot there. And if you just Google David Lay or Dr. David Lay, that's the website that pops up the most. Um, and you can find lots of blog stuff that I've written about all of this stuff and about sexual psychology. All right. Thank you so much again for coming on. And uh, you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram and many other scientists and professionals and sex educators will say the same thing. In actuality, there's evidence that pornography does help couples to enhance their sexual life. It does empower women in the industry. Uh, check out Tara Patrick if you're questioning that. Um, and it's a good form of entertainment. Uh, as long as it is not consumed by minors, as long as whoever is watching it is well aware that it is a form of entertainment and not a form of sexual education or a presentation of what sex is like in real life, 
um, it's a good thing. Whatever you do, do not for one minute think that what you see in porn is how all women want or like to be treated. Just like when you see a Hollywood film and you know that it's all make-believe and those are actors who portray different characters. It's not different when it comes to pornography. Just like you know that behind every Hollywood film there are scripts, actors, directors, producers, rehearsals, reshoots, etc., etc. Don't forget that the same technical and not so sexy structure is behind creating most porn videos. Um, talent must be tested every two weeks. Paperwork is checked and validated. There is a crew of makeup artists, uh, lighting, audio, assistants, and so on, on a porn set as well. So don't think and expect that you can do everything you see in porn uh, with every woman you meet. And I've got news for you. Even if you meet a porn star, because of her career choice, don't think that she's necessarily jumping into bed with everything that moves, especially you. <laughs> if you respect women and respect consent and want to help create a safe environment for women, especially promiscuous women, who I admire the most, <laughs> uh, the world will be a better place. Years ago, I've worked in the adult industry, and one thing I really loved is to see how much respect the cast and crew give the performers. Um, now, I know that's not always the case, unfortunately, um, but I can absolutely say that most people in the adult industry are wonderful, loving, open-minded, educated people. Unfortunately, there are bad apples in every basket. So to sum it all up, everything I talked about, I can't, no sex positive person, professional or not, uh, talk about this topic of sexuality without talking about the big fat elephant in the room. <laughs> Um, the enemy of everything that has to do with sexuality, religion and conservatism, the source of sex phobia, the ones that will shame you for going with nature, the ones that say that even talking about sex is a bad thing, the ones who think and believe that by not talking about it and by not educating our fellow Americans, young and old, about sexuality, relationships, and acceptance of our differences, those are the ones that cause so much harm in our society. Those are the ones that have no problem disowning their own child because of their sexual choices or if they come out of the closet. It's a shame for us even to have closets in our society and all of it harms our society, harms our young ones in ways that are shameful for us. And like I mentioned before, countries where sex phobia is non-existent are by far leading all other countries with the least violence against women and the LBGTQ community, uh, the lowest in the world with STDs and unwanted pregnancies. Sex workers are safe and are accepted in society without shame and prosecution. And the children in those societies are educated about, about sexuality and relationships. And it is not uncomfortable for them and for their parents to talk about it at home or in school. Unfortunately, over here in the US, the opposite is true. Even though there is lots of evidence that this approach only makes things worse and harms people. Only abstinence education not only does not work, but it actually harms. Because like I said, you cannot shut nature down. You cannot suppress what is natural and a major part of our being. Just like you cannot shut down hunger and breathing. Sex phobia, coming from all religions, only imposes shame and guilt for something so natural, beautiful and healthy. Not having laws and regulations for sex education in our schools, the right sex education, not the religious sex education, which is not really education. Uh, it's just creating shame and guilt and teaching that sex is forbidden and wrong. Not educating our youth about LBGTQ and homosexuality is harmful. In countries where it is taught in schools as early as fourth grade, um, there is no animosity towards transgenders and homosexuals because their citizens learn from an early age that it is a part of being a human and it's normal. Yes, normal. 
instead what we get from conservatives and from the religious is that if you're not like us, if you're different, you're less of a human than we are. If you believe abortion is wrong, even though it's your body, you have to abide by our beliefs. If I get offended by anything sexual, then it should not be available to anyone. The war on sex is a comprehensive attack on sexual education, entertainment, expression, health care, and officials at each level of government, unfortunately, have a lot of discretion about how to pursue this war. America's war on sex is a comprehensive, well-coordinated attack by a large number of groups, actually, local, state, and federal government, as well as morality groups, decency groups, right-wing media, right-wing think tanks like the American Center for Law and Justice. It's not enough for some people to say, I don't want to go to a nude beach. They say, I don't want to go to a nude beach, and you shouldn't have the right to go to a nude beach either. I don't want to get an abortion, and you shouldn't have the right to get an abortion either. I uh, don't want to have group sex in a commercial venue, and you shouldn't have the opportunity to do that if you want to. So the war on sex is, in one sense, a war to take away the rights that people actually have to do things, to say things, to feel things that some people don't think they should have the right to do. Uh, for example, in California, the Town & Country Hotel in San Diego was going to host a swingers convention, 3,000 swingers taking over the Town & Country Hotel. Nobody complained. The Alcohol Beverage Control Commission of the state of California came in and said to the Town & Country Hotel, if you host the swingers convention, we're going to take away your license. The Town & Country Hotel in San Diego said, hey, we're not serving any alcohol at these events. The ABC said, we don't care. You have a license. That makes it our business. We don't think that you, as a licensee, should be hosting an event where people are going to be having group sex. So take your pick. Do you want your license or do you want their business? Well, certainly, America has a love-hate relationship with sexuality, or, if you will, a schizophrenic relationship with sexuality. There's no question that what Americans are doing in their bedrooms is becoming more and more radical. Uh, the, um, the sexual repertoires of Americans at home, privately, without question, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. On the other hand, the government has acquired more and more tools to regulate sexual expression over the last 30 years. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that people who are afraid of sexuality, they are vigorously uh, pursuing whatever means they can to regulate other people's sexuality. I'm afraid that the war on sex is getting more intense and more comprehensive. Uh, in the area of uh, adult entertainment, for example, the federal government has handed down a series of indictments. It's unbelievable that in the United States, there's actually pictures and words that you can't sell because the government decides that it's obscene. The whole concept of obscenity is obscene. The, the right to see South Park may actually depend on the right to watch Butt Busters 3. So um, all of this sexually oriented stuff is connected. The regulation of sexuality is the gateway into undermining secular democracy. The regulation of sexuality is the gateway into using morality as the criterion for governance rather than secular pluralism. And I'm not going to get into uh, how many teens are homeless in America only because their family disowned them and threw them out of the house after they came out of the closet. I can go on and on, but I'll save the elephant in the room for a different video. Anyways, my peeps, if you're still here listening to me blabber, blabber I applaud you, <laughs> but I will pass it on to you. Uh, what are your thoughts about it, about everything I just talked about? 
about sexual education in America, uh, monogamy, sex work, and just sex in general. Uh, leave your comments below and share your thoughts. I'm sure that this was very uncomfortable for many viewers, uh, but my goal and motivation is to put those conversations out there and try to have a dialogue with the opposition. Is that possible? It's hard, but maybe it can be done, hopefully. Um, I am a secular humanist uh, who gets very uncomfortable and frustrated when some humans have to suffer because of other humans' beliefs. Uh, that's just me. What can I say? <laughs> it's the policeman in me, uh, if you will, uh, who cares for the innocent and wants to help and protect the ones who are bullied by others. Uh, because that's exactly what is happening to sex workers, uh, to many women, uh, to the LGBTQ community, uh, and, and most of our fellow Americans who are simply sexually open, like me. But yeah, I put tons of links down below for you if you want to dig deeper into the subject. Uh, full videos of the clips you've seen in this video, links to studies and research that was conducted on these uh, issues, uh, articles, and much more. All the links down below also for the books that I mentioned. Um, and if you want to participate and help make a difference, like to fight back on FOSTA and SESTA acts, fight for better sex education in our schools, please, please, please do it. Your voice counts. Your participation is needed to help the millions of Americans who suffer because of sex phobia in our culture. And most importantly, stay curious ask questions and always, always zoom out of your world and take a look at other points of views. Even if you don't agree with everything I said, even if you're not a human being who accepts others with their differences, try to learn how, because we're all citizens of this world. We're all the same homo sapiens family. The more we care about each other, the better the world will be. <laughs> now let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> Kumbaya, my lord, Kumbaya, Kumbaya, my lord, Kumbaya, Kumbaya, my lord. I'm kidding, uh, but I started sounding like a naive woo-woo leader for a second. Woo-woo leader. Anyways, my sexy peeps, I uh, love you. Uh, your time's up on Planet Joe. I applaud you for sticking around to the end. I appreciate you and I hope to hear your thoughts and to see your comments down below. Uh, I will read all of them. I will respond to most of them. Just be respectful, okay? And uh, let's have an intelligent conversation. If you like this video, please hit that like button. And if you're not a subscriber yet, don't be shy. Hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you can get notified when I upload a new video. All right, my peeps, stay curious, stay sexy. I'll see you in my next video. Love ya. Bye.